First of all, thank you for choosing to watch this video among the many others out there. In your impression, what are Native Americans like? Is their life about hunting, gathering, and living a primitive lifestyle as taught in books? Recently, a well-known American archaeologist, Ed Barnhart, has become quite popular. Internet users are excited about his online courses, and even the History Channel has created a special segment for Barnhart to lecture on TV. His expertise lies in exploring the Americas. He raised an interesting question. What do you think Native Americans' lives were like before the European explorer Columbus discovered America? Were they living in thatched houses or teepees? Were they involved in daily activities such as hunting or farming? Perhaps the knowledge we have learned has led us to completely misconceived perceptions. We have all been blinded by history books. Contemporary archaeological research has revealed that Native Americans, or at least many of them, led rich and prosperous lives, even surpassing other places in the world. Today's story is sure to exceed any preconceptions you may have had about Native American civilization. Today, let's talk about the hidden truths of Native American civilization. In 1950, a Mexican named Louis Lear led a small team through the wilderness for a day and a night to reach a place called Palenque, located on the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. This area was covered by bushes and dense forests, a desolate land seldom visited even by the locals. So why did Louis Lear come to such a place? Because for a long time on the Yucatan Peninsula, a legend has been passed down like this. Under Palenque, there is plenty of gold. In the 18th century, when the Spaniards arrived on the Yucatan Peninsula, they heard this legend. They were excited and rushed here, hoping to find a treasure-filled jungle. These Spaniards made great efforts to explore an empty land, but all they found were remnants, a heap of ruins made of stone and earth with nothing valuable. Therefore, the Spaniards, desperate and finding nothing valuable, named it Palenque. Later, archaeologists and historians arrived at the remaining ruins of this fortress and reached a general conclusion. This was a native settlement of the Maya people around 2,000 years ago. The scale was quite small, with only a few thousand people, not worth mentioning. Thus, a definite conclusion was drawn that Palenque was a low-quality product in the archaeological world, not worth exploring. Louis Lear arrived here in 1950, also an archaeologist, but he didn't believe in these unconvincing conclusions. Personally, Louis Lear believed that legends were not baseless. In Palenque, there surely were secrets buried that people didn't know about. He hoped to find gold, which also meant discovering a buried civilization. Fortunately, Louis Lear received significant archaeological funding from the Rockefeller Foundation. With both the money and a team, Louis Lear decided to fulfill his dream and head to Palenque. The archaeological team stationed at Palenque diligently excavated every day meticulously cleaning the remnants of the largest structure there. After three months of intensive work, Louis Lear was amazed to discover that this towering mound was, in fact, a temple. The temple was built on a towering pyramid, utilizing the consistent architectural style of the Maya people. It featured a stepped structure, with the bottom step being 197 feet long. The temple was constructed atop a nine-tiered pyramid, revealing a lavishly adorned interior. On all four walls, there were murals, although time had taken its toll, causing the murals to peel and fade. On the rear wall, two massive gray murals displayed hundreds of intricately carved Maya hieroglyphs. Louis Lear gazed in admiration at the carved glyphs, even though he couldn't understand a single one. However, 
he knew that his judgment was entirely correct. This civilization was indeed prosperous, and Palenque was genuinely a place full of gold. However, the civilization that belonged to these people remained unknown. Right as Louis Lear was engrossed in examining the hieroglyphs under the mountain, he suddenly stumbled. Almost falling, upon closer inspection, he found a massive uneven stone slab beneath the temple. As he was about to turn away, he noticed something peculiar about the stone. This enormous stone was meticulously carved from a single block with an area of about one square meter and two holes on either side. Could this stone be lifted? Louis Lear quickly called an assistant with two steel rods and inserted them into the holes. Together, they lifted the stone. Beneath it, they discovered something, and Louis Lear's eyes widened. Under the stone, a staircase leading inside the pyramid was revealed. Louis Lear and his team rejoiced because they knew that a secret door meant there must be some hidden secrets. They realized that at the end of this staircase, more shocking secrets were waiting to be uncovered. However, the stairway was filled with debris, rocks, and broken tiles. It seemed like someone intentionally blocked the passage. Louis Lear's team proceeded with extreme caution, taking three years to clear the staircase and passage. At the end of the narrow passage, they found a rudimentary stone coffin. Upon opening it, they discovered six corpses inside. Naturally, Louis Lear doubted that the Maya would go through such trouble just to bury a stone coffin filled with corpses at the end of a tunnel. This was probably just a decoy, meant to deceive and blindfold others. Louis Lear continued his careful search on the walls of the tunnel to see if there was anything else unusual. Indeed, he found something extraordinary. He discovered a triangular-shaped stone slab. Subsequently, he stumbled upon a secret that left everyone astonished. Behind the triangular stone slab was a tomb with a wide, round domed roof. In the center of the tomb was a massive stone coffin. The coffin was carved from a single block of limestone, and the lid alone weighed up to five tons. The intricate bas-reliefs on the coffin lid left the archaeological team speechless. These were highly complex and sophisticated sculptures, rivaling modern art. The archaeological team used modern machinery to open the coffin lid. Inside, they found a skeleton adorned with a jade mask, surrounded by numerous burial items, such as jade and treasures. Afterward, the identity of this skeleton was deciphered. It was Pekel II, the ruler of the Palenque region. The entire temple of the inscriptions was his tomb. Louis Lear's discovery in the 1950s can be considered a groundbreaking moment because, at that time, most historians believed that before the Spanish entered the peninsula, the powerful civilizations of the indigenous people in Mexico were not worth mentioning. They were considered primitive tribes with no apparent signs of civilization. However, the revelation of the tomb of Pekel II at the Temple of the Inscriptions in Palenque shocked the world. People were astonished to realize that, before the arrival of Europeans, the indigenous civilizations of North America had already reached such a high level of development. Furthermore, Louis Lear discovered a structure resembling a palace near the pyramid known as the Palenque Palace. The palace was built on a platform measuring 328 feet in length and 262 feet in width. On this platform, a 49 feet tall stone tower was constructed for astronomical observation. Additionally, there were various courtyards, terraces, and rooms inside the palace. These rooms were adorned with magnificent bas reliefs. Louis Lear believed that this splendid palace was likely the most revered place for the Maya, with the astronomical observatory serving religious and celestial observation purposes. Louis Lear believed that around the astronomical observatory, there must be a large ancient residential area of the people of ancient Palenque. 
Unfortunately, he did not have the opportunity to witness this himself, as he passed away in 1979. Historians later relied on his findings combined with the remaining artifacts in other areas to partially decipher the hieroglyphs of the ancient Maya. Archaeologists also decoded part of the history of the Palenque region based on the inscriptions in the royal tomb. According to the hieroglyphic inscriptions in the king's tomb, Palenque was described as a city-state on the Yucatan Peninsula, similar to the city-states of ancient Greece. The owner of the Temple of the Inscription's tomb was the 18th King of Palenque. During his reign, Palenque experienced unprecedented prosperity, engaging in extensive trade with neighboring city-states and participating in wars between these city-states. How vast was this city? The current historical park of Palenque, planned by the government, covers an area of about eight square miles. This plan is not arbitrary, but represents the broadest limit of the archaeological site. The determination was based on the results of over 10 years of archaeological surveys. Palenque was a city that rivaled modern cities in terms of planning. It had tall outer walls, agricultural land, and an irrigation system. Inside the city, there were extensive residential areas, streets, temple districts, and palace complexes where nobility resided. The city also featured large and small plazas for communal gatherings. Additionally, within the city, canals and channels were constructed to provide water for the residents. According to archaeological estimates, the population of Palenque was around 100,000 people, slightly smaller than the 150,000 population of Athens in the 5th century BC. However, a significant portion of Athens' population lived outside the city and was not counted as city residents. Currently, much of Palenque remains buried beneath soil and dense vegetation. Only a fraction of the city can be cleared, constituting roughly one-tenth of the historical park. Palenque remained vibrant until the 8th century and then suddenly disappeared. The reasons behind Palenque's disappearance will be discussed later. Contemporary archaeology discoveries like the National Park State of Palenque are not limited to Mexico, but extend globally, encompassing not only ancient America, but also the United States. In terms of scale, these discoveries might surpass many expectations. In 1849, a U.S. Army lieutenant named James Hervey Simpson led an expedition into Chaco Canyon, located in the northwest of New Mexico. This area is a desert region with vast stretches of golden sand, sparse vegetation, and a touch of greenery during the rainy season. Simpson, a topographer for the U.S. Army since 1848, after the Mexico and U.S. War, was tasked with surveying the terrain of the newly acquired territory. New Mexico had officially become part of the United States. Facing scarcity of food and water in New Mexico, with the population concentrated in the north-central region where water sources were available, the northwestern region lacked water, dominated by mountains and desert. One day, Simpson arrived at Chaco Canyon and, looking through a viewing glass, was surprised to observe evidence of a large-scale settlement at the heart of the canyon. The local residents informed Simpson that the canyon was an uninhabited area. There was no water source, making it unsuitable for cultivating crops. No one had lived in the canyon for centuries. So, how could there be a settlement there? Upon reaching the seemingly inhabited area, Simpson and the survey team were surprised to find that it was an abandoned architectural complex. After thorough examination, they identified approximately 15 building clusters. The scale of each complex was substantial, with the largest covering an area of about 107,000 square feet, containing 650 rooms, and the tallest building being a four-story structure. A 107,000 square feet building might seem normal for modern people, but for Lieutenant Simpson in 1849, 
around 170 years ago. It was an unbelievable shock. At that time, the entire United States couldn't boast many buildings of such scale. Even the White House had an area of just over 55,000 square feet with more than 500 rooms, excluding basement levels, and it was only two stories high. After the American Civil War, major cities like New York and Chicago began constructing four-story buildings. The first skyscraper in the United States and the world, the Home Insurance Building, was erected in 1885, reaching a height of only 10 stories and 138 feet. This was considered a remarkable achievement according to the standards of that era. For those before 1850, witnessing a four-story building in the American wilderness at Chaco Canyon, especially one in ancient ruins, was extraordinary. We can understand this shock no differently than seeing a UFO appear before us. What made Simpson even more astonished was that the building complex had a multi-story structure from the outside to the inside. The outer walls were 36 inches thick, facing northeast according to standards, and the buildings inside the walls varied in structure, resembling the architecture of ancient Roman amphitheaters with small residential houses and squares. 21st century architects later used computers to restore the original shape of the site, which looked like this. It clearly resembled a modern high-end condominium complex, known as Condo in North America. One can imagine how monumental Lieutenant Simpson's discovery was at that time. He reported his findings to the government and named the canyon Chaco Canyon. From then on, archaeologists came to study, and they concluded that these ruins were a settlement built by an indigenous group called the Pueblo. They imagined the scene at that time like this. 2,000 years ago, Chaco Canyon was still a lush forest and Native Americans settled there early on. They built large settlements and cultivated the land, but by the 12th century, due to climate change, Chaco Canyon experienced a severe 50-year drought. The Pueblo people had no choice. They had to abandon their homeland, taking their sophisticated construction techniques, moving to other places, and finding new water sources in different regions. They built complex structures not only for the Native Americans living and settling in the western United States today, but also for Native Americans in other places, showcasing advanced civilizations. Barnhart, the archaeologist mentioned at the beginning of the video, highlighted recent discoveries by archaeologists in which indigenous people built large, pyramid-shaped houses and independent dwellings thousands of years ago in the central, eastern, and southern United States. Inside these structures were spacious and well-lit rooms with houses and dwellings connected to each other, forming communities and cities. Surrounding these communities were commercial centers, streets, and large squares for gatherings. Outside the city, there were lush fields and an irrigation system. Barnhart referred to the cultures of these indigenous people as the Mississippi culture. He mentioned that the complexity of the Mississippi culture surpasses our imagination. These Native American chiefdoms had formed an extensive trade network stretching from the Rocky Mountains in the north to the Great Lakes region, south to the Gulf of Mexico, and east to the Atlantic Ocean. They traded various goods, including copper handicrafts, fur tools, animal bone products, food, weapons, and even seasonal pets. This was truly a new and unexpected aspect of Native American culture. In other words, before Columbus arrived in the Americas, indigenous people had long enjoyed prosperous lives, living in spacious homes, consuming abundant agricultural produce, and having sufficient food supplies at their disposal, free from worries. However, later on, due to climate change, some areas became unsuitable for cultivation, leading to abandonment, as seen in places like Chaco Canyon in New Mexico. What is even more terrifying is that when Europeans arrived in the Americas, they brought with them infectious diseases such as measles, smallpox, 
and these diseases spread among the indigenous people through their existing trade networks, causing a significant number of Native American deaths and the collapse of social orders and chiefdoms and states. The harsh reality could possibly be that two to three centuries before future generations of Europeans deeply penetrated the interior of the Americas and witnessed the civilization of indigenous peoples, Native American societies and states had already declined. Subsequently, as Europeans advanced further into the interior of the Americas, they witnessed a severe decline in indigenous civilization within less than two centuries, with the Native American population decreasing by approximately 95%. This decline forced the surviving few to flee and revert to a nomadic lifestyle, engaging in fishing, hunting, and gathering. The Europeans of later generations, upon witnessing such scenes, mistakenly believed that this represented the perpetual state of indigenous people throughout history, assuming them to be primitive tribes. Consequently, they recorded all of this in history books. Online communities, upon hearing Barnhart's lecture, quickly woke up to this realization. However, what people are truly curious about is the origin of indigenous peoples in the ancient Maya. Where did they come from, and why did they have such advanced civilizations? A researcher named Eric von Daniken strongly argues that the Native American civilization in North America could be attributed to extraterrestrial influences. Evidence he presents includes a recurring theme in Maya sculptures depicting figures wearing what looks like breathing masks or astronaut helmets, even including images of helmets worn by astronauts. Another vivid example is the carvings on the sarcophagus of the Palenque King mentioned earlier. The relief sculpture shows the king wearing an astronaut-like breathing mask, sitting on a chair resembling a control seat, and depicts Palenque sitting on a rocket, launching into space. Although Daniken's conclusions are controversial and carry a hint of sensationalism, archaeologists cannot explain how the Maya acquired such rich astronomical knowledge. For instance, their advanced solar calendar suggests an in-depth understanding of astronomy. The Maya culture itself believes that a feathered serpent god descended from the sky and transmitted knowledge of various aspects of astronomy and architecture to them. In conclusion, unraveling the mixed origins of Native American history remains a challenging issue. Nevertheless, Modern historians and archaeologists have at least begun to acknowledge that what they have seen may not necessarily represent the entire truth. Notably, if there is a willingness to expand our thinking, to look at events and entities from a different perspective, and to believe in things that were once considered myth, baseless stories, or even superstition, valuable insights into ancient history may be gained. Who among us is ready to broaden our perspectives? challenge our beliefs, and explore the unknown. Perhaps in doing so, we might discover valuable treasures in our lives, education, and careers. What are your thoughts? Feel free to share in the comments below the video. Our sharing for today will pause here. If you find this video helpful, don't forget to share it with a friend. Thank you very much. Goodbye and see you again.